Maple Leaf. What's up? You made it. You made it. Those people are still asleep in these seats. I bet you. We can't blame them. So how are you guys doing? Are you taking my pic? Are you taking my pic? Can you give me a minute? Because I'll pose. <laughs> we'll do a calendar right here in Liberty Towers Church. We'll make that happen. Hot chicks. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, that hurts. See how much effort I put in for you. Um, so that kick reminds me, people ask me all the time, why did you become a stand-up comedian? And I'm, it's fairly obvious I didn't make cheerleading. And so I have a lot of issues. Um, and, uh, you know, I had to go out to Hollywood and I thought if I was on shows like I was, you know, General Hospital and Young and the Restless, that all the mean girls would be nice to me. But here's a little piece of advice. Don't go to your 20-year high school reunion in a cheerleading skirt because there's no more squad. And um, it doesn't fit the same way it should. And so basically, I speak to businesses, and this is a, a women's empowerment day, and some of you might be going, well, why would they bring a stand-up comedian? And I work in show business, and it is a business, and I just was a Detroit suburb kid with no connections to get there, but I've managed to have a career in entertainment for over 20 years. I started when I was two, so um, <laughs> I'm here today to share my story, maybe give you some fun Hollywood trivia about some familiar faces, but help you get the life you want because sometimes, just like in Hollywood in life, we're all trying to get to the next level and we don't even know how to start. And so I'm gonna share some of what I've learned and hopefully I can help you guys get unstuck. I come from sort of a mixed marriage. Uh, my father is an Italian Catholic from Detroit and he married a very Southern church lady from Alabama. She's a Presbyterian. And um, they sent me to Dutch Christian Reform School. So, I mean, look what can happen when you dream big for your kids. Um, my dad was a Navy guy and then he ended up working in human resources. And my mother actually is a Vietnam vet who was a stay-at-home mom. And just to give you a little insight of my mother, she's very Christian, more Christian than anyone here ever. And um, she's never had alcohol. She's never said a swear word. She's never smoked a cigarette. She's 73, she's still a virgin. So, <laughs> that's how I was raised. Perfection is the norm, perfection. Um, so, they never failed at anything. And I was not blessed with the gift of perfectionism. I was always coloring outside the lines, which is why I had to go to kindergarten twice. And so when I saw those coloring things, all my anxiety came back when I walked in. Like, <laughs> But um, so basically, I was just that kid. I was in this little Dutch Reform Christian school, and I'm the Italian kid. And we didn't have the word bullying back in the 80s. You know, we didn't call it bullying. We just, like all the boys would yell at me and then I would yell back and then they would yell some more. And it was sort of like good training for my hecklers in stand-up comedy. And uh, you never meet a comedian that has a normal childhood. You've never met any of us. So yeah, I was definitely picked on and I used humor as my coping mechanism. I definitely was a motivational speaker. I started that in first grade when I threatened the lives of Jenny Grabda and all the girls that were auditioning for the role of Mary in the Christmas pageant until I found out that Mary didn't have any lines, and so I wrote my own part as King Herod, and I totally crushed it, and I feel like I was standing up for gender equality even back then. Um, and I basically never really let them see me sweat. I knew that I, I wanted to be popular, I wanted to be accepted, I wanted to kiss a boy, you guys. That's how I prayed. I said, dear God, thank you for this day, please let me kiss a boy, not just any boy, Bo Duke from Dukes of Hazzard. You need to be specific, <laughs> Bo Duke. And then it was Chachi from, uh, yes. And so my grandma went to California and found where John Schneider was and got me an autograph picture. And it says, to Carrie, I love ya. Which he meant literally, I know this. And um, I just always thought Hollywood was the greatest place, the greatest place I could be. And I didn't know what I wanted to do there, but when my mother put me in ballet lessons at Noretta Dunworth Dance Studio, I felt like I was home. I felt like I knew what my dream was. I was gonna be a professional dancer or a Dallas Cowboy cheerleader, you pick. Um, I felt great. I felt like I was good enough. And it was such an awesome thing to find something that made me so happy. And I knew that that was my path in life until life took a 
left turn. When I was 11 years old, I'll never forget being called into the doctor's office after I'd had the routine scoliosis screening that all girls had to have for curvature of the spine. That was the first test I ever failed. I spent the next year in and out of hospitals, having electric shock therapy, trying to stop the curve of my runaway spine. They told me I was gonna have to be in a brace for six years, a full body brace, and I wasn't gonna be Claire from the Nutcracker, I was gonna be Joan Cusack from 16 Candles. Do you remember her? She couldn't even get a drink of water. And that didn't even work. So when they told me I was gonna have to have spinal reconstructive surgery, or be paralyzed, possibly. I was fighting a completely new bully, and this bully was winning. I ended up being flown to Miami Children's Hospital. My father didn't want to just settle for what they were telling him about his daughter. They said I was gonna have to have spinal reconstruction and be in a body cast for six months. My physicality was gonna be completely limited. I ended up having the surgery, and I remember when I came out of surgery, my dad made me posters of all my boyfriends, Kirk Cameron, Scott Baio, Corey Feldman from Goonies, uh, Sean Astin, and they with little motivational quotes. The cool thing in life is that I ended up meeting every single one of these guys. And I ended up cross-country skiing four months later because I didn't believe the doctors. I didn't believe that they had to say. Sometimes we have to think outside the box. My father found a test case surgery from Europe. I was one of the first kids to ever have it. It's what they're doing now. And remember the body cast that they said, it, I never had one day in the body cast. So sometimes life takes a left turn. You need to look behind door number two. You might just have to ski over there. By the way, that was the last time I skied. I mean, there's just no reason to do that. It's very cold. <laughs> Not really. I'm glad that I'm physically able to do whatever I want, but why? You know, uh, I'm not a fan of any, like, I don't know if you're hiker people here. I don't get why anybody would walk up a mountain unless you're on The Bachelorette. Like, why would you do that? There's no buffet up there, you know? And so my mother was like, okay, so you're not, you know, my dancing was a bit limited. Maybe you could be an actress. And so I was like, yes, I'm going to be an actress. So I did what any, I, I got this thing, it was called a phone book, for if there's young girls here, it's like Google, but it had pages in it. And so I looked up theater, and I called this theater, and I said, I'm Carrie Pomeroy, I was 11, and I'm an actress, so you need to talk the talk. And they said, that's great, we're having auditions for this play, it was a uh, Lillian Talman show, The Children's Art, we're looking to cast Mary Tilburg, she's really evil, and she's a bad seed, and she's just, everyone hates her, because she's so bad. Guess who got the part? <laughs> This girl. My mother said I'd been rehearsing in her kitchen my entire life. And I went on stage and I got to yell and scream and break things and it was awesome. And I found my first crew because theater people are awesome. Nobody's normal. And as we like to say, normal people don't make history. We were the island of misfit toys. I never sat at the pool table in my life, but theater made me feel awesome. And I think it's important that you know in Hollywood, behind every great production, there's a crew. And everybody has a part to play. And at a very young age, I found the importance of finding your crew. So I want to ask you guys, in your life, if you think about it, who are you running with? Do you have a crew? Are you looking to attract other people that are like-minded? Are you looking to attract other people that have the same kind of goals as you? Because what we like to say is that success attract success. Are you hanging with people that are going to raise you up? Or are you hanging with people that are going to bring you down? So after I got my role as Mary Tilford, I went on to do other roles. I joined the Dearborn Youth Theater. That's where they would put 117 kids in one play. And the only woman that could do that was my first acting teacher, Mary Brummer. Mary Brummer was sort of magical. She had gray hair that was like a little bleach blonde. She had a cigarette in one hand, coffee, and probably a little vodka in the other. And you could tell like the outfit she had on, like she probably hadn't gone to bed and she was probably using medical marijuana way before it was legal. And, um, but can you blame her? It's like 170 kids. And I, we were doing Alice in Wonderland. And I wanted to be Alice so bad, but I, I was so scared to sing in front of all the kids. So she gets down on her knees in the basement of the Dearborn Civic Center. She's like, you want to be Alice? I'm like, yeah. You think you can do this? I was like, I don't know. She's like, 
There's only one way to find out. You gotta go out there and you gotta sing your song because I think there's something special about you. <laughs> so I got up in front of a hundred kids and I sang this song that my mom taught me. I'm hard hearted Hannah, the vamp of Savannah, the meanest gal in town. Leather is tough, but Hannah's heart is tougher. I'm the girl who likes to see the men suffer. I didn't know. I was singing about a lady of the night. <laughs> but I got the part. I got the part. I was caterpillar number nine, and it was so... And I found out the only reason I didn't get the part of Alice is because Molly Woodside had blonde hair. So I totally fixed that. I stole a bottle of peroxide from my grandpa's medicine cabinet. I was blonde. It was amazing. And um, So I kept acting, and I moved on. And I, I remember Mary being my first mentor. We talk about mentors. It's not like you have to go sign up to get a mentor. Mentors can walk into your life. You just have to recognize them. When we were drinking Slurpees and sitting in the basement of the Civic Center, she was teaching us that we could do anything we wanted to do. We could be anything we wanted to be. And all these years later, a lot of those kids grew up to be professional entertainers or in the entertainment or in the arts because in the middle of a suburb of Detroit, she said, yes, you can. She was the first person in my life that said, yes, you can. Now, I also had another cheering section, my mother and my father. My Italian father is so proud of me. He always carries my 8 by 10 headshot in his wallet, just in case. <laughs> like, I cannot walk into a barbershop where he's been, because he's been, like, bragging. And he's always meeting, like, other celebrities, like, parents and stuff. And he's friends with, um, you know, Trisha Yearwood, the country singer, Garth Brooks' wife. He's like, oh, yeah, we always compare notes about our daughters. I'm like, Dad, you're never going to win that one. Like, you should just let that go. <laughs> and my grandmother used to brag about me, my southern grandmama. And she would, like, brag about me. And in true grandma fashion, she'd just add a few details. Do you know what I mean? So I go back down to Alabama. And yes, I was on The Tonight Show. She just felt like, just whatever. So they'd be like, she's like, we're so proud of you. We heard you was on Broadway with Chris Rock. And Grandmama says, you're hosting the Academy Awards. You know? <laughs> and PR is never bad, right? So I would just go, yes, yes. And my opener is Michael Jackson. I just want you to know that. And uh, so I, you might be thinking, oh yeah, Carrie had all these, these cheerleaders. The thing that I'm talking about is the people that were my yes people. For every person that said yes, I had a 10 that said no. But in my life now, I'm choosing not to focus on them and not giving them any power. Because I never stopped trying to fit in. I never stopped trying to sit at the right lunch table. I had the moment in eighth grade where I was holding my burnt chicken nuggets and my chocolate milk and Kelly Mars looked at me and said, there's no room for you at this table. And I remember feeling like Mary and Joseph did when there was no room for them in the inn. And um, to an eighth grade girl, that's a horrible feeling. And I think it did something to me. I retreated to my place of solace, stall number four in the girls' bathroom. And there was a lie that was implanted in my life that said, you're not worthy to be one of us. You're not cool. And I think back about how that life might have affected my life. And all of us might have a Kelly Mars in their lives. And by the way, yes, that's her real name. You can find her on Facebook. <laughs> Tell her how you feel. <laughs> how did that lie, think about it. Was there a lie that was spoken to you when you were younger? About you? How did that affect you? And what if right now you could erase it? I have a homework assignment for you guys after my session's done or when you go home today. Don't be afraid of this. Write it down. It may be two things, it may be five things. Write down a lie that was spoken to you or about you in column A. Somebody told you you weren't good enough. Somebody told you you weren't worthy. Somebody told you you weren't the right look. Now in column B, I know that there's a truth that's going to be the opposite of that lie because that's usually what happens in life. When we start believing a lie, it's because we're so strongly called to walk in that opposite truth that people can get intimidated by that even at a young age. So if you write the lie and then you write the truth about yourself, let's try to focus 
on how big that truth can be in your future. Because we're not here to change the past, but we don't want to live there. So I ended up going to college. I went to University of Michigan, and uh, I majored in musical theater, which means, would you like fries with that? And uh, <laughs> I really learned from the best there. I took every opportunity to get scholarships and internships. And one thing I learned about that is you can get free stuff if you ask. I was never afraid to ask. I wanted to learn, I wanted to be there, I wanted to help out, and sometimes I would get those scholarships and internships just because I was the first one to say, I need some help. There's no shame in that. And I worked really hard. One of my favorite directors from Hollywood told me, kid, it takes 99% luck to be there, but it takes 99% skill and talent to stay. You better be ready when your chance comes along. And who are you learning from? Who are you learning from? I wanted to learn from the best of the best because in Hollywood, you usually only get one shot at it. Now think about your life, think about your dreams, think about something that you want to do. Who's the best in your sphere of influence? Do you know anyone that's doing what you want to do? Are you willing to learn from them? Go and ask them to coffee. Now my dad gave me this advice when I went on my first date, he said, Ask lots of questions because people like to talk about themselves. I think that applies to us pursuing our dreams. Find somebody that stepped out two steps before you and say, I want to hear your story. And also, they're not going to say no to free coffee. So, <laughs> I, sophomore year of college, we had to do an evaluation. And it was sort of like Survivor slash American Idol where the esteemed faculty would tell us that they thought I was good enough to be a professional performer on Broadway. We had to sing and dance and act. And they said I was a pretty good actor, an okay dancer. And they didn't think my singing was good enough to be a professional entertainer. They suggested that maybe I just drop the program and find something else to major in. But I knew that performing is what I wanted to do. So how did I take that? I channeled that 11-year-old girl when the doctor said, no, you can't. And I looked at them and I said, watch me. You have to remember that somebody's opinion of you cannot define your future. I went to New York that summer. I auditioned for professional theater jobs. I got 13 job offers, and I learned that there were people out there that were willing to hire me and pay me to sing. Now, there was a lot of things in my life that I knew from a very young age. I wanted to go to Hollywood. I wanted to go do big things. Now, for a kid in Detroit, that didn't seem like a really popular life course. But basically, nobody told me I couldn't do it. So I had, to, I had to try. I was always making a new leap. So after I graduated college, my parents and I headed in the minivan. We drove all the way across country, and they dropped me in temporary housing. And as they were walking away, I was standing there in the dimly lit hallway. My dad had tried to draw me a map of Hollywood, because young people, we did not have Google Maps back then, and I was bawling because I didn't know how to read a map. And my mother's like, this place is horrible. There's no Christians here. You're gonna end up in church with Tom Cruise. You are. <laughs> Have him sign this t-shirt, you know. <laughs> You're in Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, and I was like standing there totally alone, terrified. Never when I made a leap in my life have I ever not been really scared. But fear is a great motivating factor. And as in the words of my favorite philosopher, Ben Halen, you might as well jump. <laughs> Thank you, old people. I didn't have a plan B. Because if I had a plan B, it would have been too easy to stay there. Some of you have been living in plan B a very long time because somebody told you that there's no plan A for you. Some of you are even living a plan C because you don't even think you're capable of even dreaming about a plan A. There's a dream inside of you. There's desires inside of you. There's a call inside of you. And the world is going, are you kidding? Who are you to do that? Who do you know? It's all about who you know. What are you gonna do? And some of you have just believed that for so long that you've let life pass you by with survival and hard things come and it just pushes you further and further back. And we as women, we're the worst because the, we're the best at lifting up other people's dreams and putting our dreams off to the side. So my challenge to you is to think about what your life would look like 
if starting today, you started to pursue your plan A. And if you don't know anybody to have coffee with, you can learn, you have YouTube. You can learn anything on YouTube. I'm awesome at origami, you should see my snowflakes. Stop watching the cat videos in the military family ring and, and crying. You can learn. We have no excuse not to learn. So I was in LA, I was just pursuing my craft and I was working in film and TV a little bit and my high school called me back to be a special guest at my high school. And immediately I was like, let's get this cheerleading uniform, let's do this, you know, I was 25. And um, I'm on stage, I walk in, there's 2,500 kids and all of my insecurities. I'm freaking out, I'm like, did I wear the right jeans? And it's just, because high school, well, they scare me to this day. And I'm being interviewed by this drama teacher, my drama teacher, and he's very dry and sarcastic, and he thought he was being funny. So in front of the whole school, he goes, you know, I don't really remember you being particularly a standout in the talent department. Who knew that you were gonna have this success, right? And I'm a stand-up comedy performer, and all the high school kids, 2,500, start chanting, do your act, do your act, like a mob. And I don't do comedy for high schoolers. I'd rather stab myself with a fork. I just don't, they don't get me, like, my sarcasm, you know, I have a joke. I'm like, I'm here, my kids are in the car, and then they all go look in the car. Okay, so, you know that I would never leave my kids, in the, one kid in the car, not two. And so, I had to do it, and I stood on stage, and I walked out there, and I just prayed that the Lord would strike me with lightning. And so, I did it happen, and I, I did a couple jokes, and they laughed. And then the room is silent, because this big football player guy in a varsity jacket, he raises his hand, and he looks at me, and he goes, I just have one question, and the room's totally silent. He goes, will you go to prom with me? And I was like, yes. <laughs> and I went, and we had such a good time. And uh, I didn't know that was illegal. Um, it just goes to show you that there's plenty of people in our life that are going to tell us, like, I didn't expect that from you. Make your life about surprising people. You don't have to be the class sweetheart. You don't have to be the favorite. Be your own favorite. So I was back in LA and I was working three jobs and it was the best of times and the worst of times. And sometimes when we're in these crazy seasons, you're thinking it's never gonna end, it's never gonna end. I think it's important to be in the moment because I look back on that in some twisted way, it was sort of my good old days, you know? And I, I got an internship and if you guys don't know what that means, that means slave labor and uh, <laughs> in Hollywood. That's what we like to call it. And I was working at night as a telemarketer, that's glamorous, for a dating service, which was great, because I would just give all the guys my phone number. And, um, and then I was a children's party entertainer, and I was a clown on weekends. And you know how people have irrational fears of clowns? It's not irrational. I was very scary, and my makeup was horrible, and I couldn't make animals for balloons. Every animal was either a snake or a worm, or a snake that got eaten by a worm. And, and it's just like we're living this life and you think, oh, this is the part, Carrie, where you get your big break. It never happened that way. Life for me was about opening one door at a time and just walking in. There was a girl out in Hollywood. They told her she didn't fit in. She didn't have the right look. She was overweight. So she booked her ticket home back to Chicago. And her agent said, just go to one.